Great. Okay. So thanks again, Sanjay. And uh, thank you to everyone for inviting me to come and speak to you. Um, it really is a great pleasure to, to come and talk to uh, to you all and tell you a little bit about some of the research that we're doing at UCL. Sanjay's given me a little bit of an introduction. I'll expand on that a little bit just to say who I am and, and sort of my background, which might help you place what it is that I'm talking about in, in the context of how I arrived at uh, doing research in this area. So as Sanjay said, I'm a professor of nanoelectronic and nanophotonic materials at, at UCL in London, uh, where I've been for, for many years. Uh, my background is originally I'm a chemical physicist. Uh, I was trained at the University of Sussex where I did my undergraduate and my uh, my PhD before I moved to, to, to UCL. And my um, take on, on the research that I'm talking to you about here is really as a physicist and an electronic engineer thinking about the materials and the devices that enable us to do some very interesting things in computation. So moving computation maybe from the digital world into um, what I'm going to call neuromorphic. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by neuromorphic as, as I go through my talk. So I'm going to talk today um, specifically about work that we've been doing for the past 10 or 12 years or so on silicon oxide and how we can take a very common material that's used very widely in, in CMOS microelectronics and do some interesting things with that. But I want to start off, first of all, by thinking a little bit about the very advanced AI machine learning systems that we are currently developing and trying to put a little bit of their capabilities into, into context. So I want to start off by just putting a piece of text up in front of you. And this is a piece of text um, on social distancing. It's a piece of text that was written during the uh, the pandemic that we're still going through to describe the experience of social distancing. We're all asked to keep uh, a, a distance from uh, from nearby uh, people in order to minimise the, the possibility of transmission of a virus. And you'll see that this piece of text is written in a very strange way. So it's written in the style of a Victorian, an English Victorian writer. And the language is very flowery. It's very, uh, very unusual. So um, the most friendly inhabitant is to frown on the familiar, familiar nod and if necessary, pass a forbidden salute without a sign of recognition. This is very old fashioned language. This is something that was written uh, only about um, a year or so ago in the style of a Victorian novelist. And this was written by a computer program. This is written by GPT-3, which is a very large artificial intelligence, a machine learning system that generates language. And you can ask this computer system to write a piece of text in the style of any style that you choose. And in this case, it was a, a Victorian novelist. Now that's extremely impressive because reading this, I look at this and I think, I would not know by reading this, that this was not written by human. This is written by a computer program. This is extremely impressive. However, let me put that into context. Let's look at the cost of training one of these very advanced machine learning systems. And on the left-hand side on the, on the y-axis, we see a logarithmic scale of the training cost. And then we see how that training cost has evolved over the years as we've gone to more and more complex, more advanced machine learning systems. And the machine learning system that I was just talking about that wrote that piece of text is this machine learning system right up here, which is now starting to approach a training cost of nearly $10 million. So this cost is going up exponentially. And you can see that we also have a number of relatively famous systems there. We have AlphaGo Zero, AlphaFold. These are DeepMind systems, Google DeepMind systems. AlphaGo Zero was the famous system that beat the, uh, the human champion at the, the, the quite advanced um, strategy game Go, AlphaFold was the system that um, enabled us to predict the folding of, of proteins. And even AlphaFold 2, which actually, strangely enough, requires considerably less training than GPT-3, which is the language synthesizer, um, even that has training costs of the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars. These costs are enormous. And there are also some drawbacks with these systems. So for example, with GPT-3, which is the system that generates this very human sounding language, it can also generate nonsense. So that's several million dollars training that goes into uh, this system. 
can produce this sort of thing. We can ask it a nonsense question. How many rainbows does it take to jump from Hawaii to 17? Makes absolutely no sense. And it will look at that and it will generate an equally nonsensical output. It won't stop and say, no, that's, that's rubbish. So all of that money, all of that time, all of that development that we put into these, the very advanced computing systems does have its drawbacks. They're very specialized. And that training cost, that's the monetary cost, but actually there's a huge energy cost to these systems. So the reason, or one of the big reasons why it costs so much so much money is because when we talk to one of these systems, we're not talking to a single computer, we're talking to a whole rack of, in this case, um, uh, GPUs, graphical processing units, very specialized units. Um, that rack is in a number of, of, of racks that are sitting within a huge air conditioned plant, something like this, a server farm that, that, that can um, consume vast amounts of energy to produce bits of text that look like they were produced by a human or to classify images or to do many of the other tasks that we ask our machine learning systems to do. So these systems use huge amounts of power and this produces a dilemma for us, a problem for us in technology. If we compare the power that is expended by uh, a human brain, for example, which is typically of the order uh, of 20 watts, with a system, a computing, a digital computing system that does more or less the same number of operations per second, then we see that there is something approaching a six order of magnitude difference in power consumption between the two systems. This is enormous. And this is part of the reason why those training costs are so high. And certainly the reason why the energy and power consumption of our systems is, is hugely uh, significant and, and largely unsustainable. So why do we have this problem? Well, fundamentally, the problem is that in the digital computers that we're all familiar with, we are limited by the von Neumann architecture. And in the von Neumann architecture, what we do is we separate the piece of the architecture that does the processing, the computation, from the piece of the architecture that stores the data, the data that we perform the processing on and the, the data that is produced by the processing. And in fact, most of the time, what our computer system is doing is simply moving data backwards and forwards between the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, and some form of memory. And there's a hierarchy of memory, but essentially what, what we're doing most of the time is just shifting data. And that causes us a number of problems. First of all, as you can imagine, that causes problems in delays, uh, in synchronization, in latency. It causes a huge power problem as well, because the power that is consumed in moving data backwards and forwards is much greater than the power that is consumed just doing the, the, the computation. So the fact that we spend most of our time moving data means that we spend the vast majority of our, or expend the vast majority of our power uh, and energy on moving data backwards and forwards. So it'd be nice if we could avoid that and think of an, an alternative way of performing our calculations. One way that, um, that we have tried to overcome this or minimize this problem is by constantly scaling our devices. So we've all, uh, hopefully we're all familiar with Moore's law, which uh, tells us that we, over a period of time, we've been very successful at taking the dimensions of, of transistors in CMOS technology and shrinking them to ever smaller and smaller sizes. And that brings with it um, an increase in the capabilities of our, uh, of our silicon chips, but it also brings with it problems associated with performing that scaling. So it's enormously technologically challenging to do that. It's also enormously expensive. And then this graph here, what I'm showing you is the cost just in designing um, a, a, a CMOS chip at various different technology nodes, as, as, as we call them, so different um, minimum design feature sizes. So currently we're looking at um, technology nodes around the 10 nanometer to seven nanometer range. And we can see here just the cost of designing that is of the order of certainly getting up to $300 million for the seven nanometer node. And this is going up exponentially so that at the five nanometer node, it's just the design costs. So not even the manufacturing costs, but the design costs are of the order of half a billion dollars. So these, these figures are, are enormous, they're eye-watering. And then we have to think about how we manufacture those features. And in order just to write those features in, in a photolithographic um, process, we have to have some very advanced machines that allow us to write 
create features that are of the order of seven nanometers and five nanometers and potentially beyond that. And here's one of those those machines. All this machine does is it writes very fine features. It's essentially a, uh, a photolithographic projection machine that is capable of, of writing five nanometer or seven nanometer features onto a 300 or 450 uh, millimeter wafer. And if that looks quite big, the next um, uh, the next slide will put that into context. Here it is in situ, and it is a very significant machine. It's very large, and this is only part of it. This is the the business end of it that actually writes the features. You need to have a laser that is separate from that that generates the UV light that is used to write those features. And this is this is essentially optics and wafer alignment and transport. And it costs about 120 million dollars just for one of these machines, and it's sold out for years. So if you want to buy one of these, if you had $120 million burning a hole in your pocket, then it, you would have to wait several years for one of these machines. They're enormously complicated, enormously expensive. So the prospect of continuing to scale the size of devices is becoming more and more difficult. We're reaching the point where essentially Moore's law, that continuous scaling has, has essentially finished. Uh, and Global Foundry is one of the uh, the big chip manufacturers, about three years or so ago, said that they would no longer pursue scaling. Instead, they were going to look at alternative ways to make um, changes in functionality on, on silicon chips. So we need to think of new ways of enhancing the um, performance of our silicon microelectronics um, and, and hopefully thinking back to the cost, the energy cost and the financial cost of training these huge machine learning systems that we're becoming more and more reliant on, thinking about ways to minimize that by thinking of new ways of um, performing computation, storing data, and so on. And what I want to do next is get back to what I said I would talk about at the beginning of this seminar, which is to talk about silicon oxide. So here what I've shown is a cartoon of a cross section through um, a typical CMOS, um, in this case, N-channel and P-channel CMOS uh, MOSFETs. So this is this is the sort of thing that we have billions of on um, modern microchips. And if we look carefully at this, we see that we have this thing here called the gate oxide, which is an insulating layer between the uh, the gate and the, 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 the source and the drain of the um, of the MOS device. And in conventional CMOS microelectronics, this gate oxide is, first of all, very thin, and it's extremely high quality. And when I say it's extremely high quality, it has very few defects. The interfaces are very cleverly engineered so that we don't have defects and, and charge traps at the interfaces. And as a result, this oxide is extremely stable. And if we were to take a sample of one of these oxides, and when I say they're very thin, they're of the order of a few nanometers in, in thickness, those thin film oxides. If we were to take a sample and on the, um, uh, let me just bring up a pointer so I can show you what I'm talking about. On the right hand side, if we took an oxide here, this green layer and put an electrode on the top and the bottom, and we applied a voltage to that and we looked at the current, what we would expect to see is essentially zero current or very low current flowing for any reasonable voltage. Well, obviously, we can take the voltage up to the point where we destroy the oxide and actually physically breaks down. But if we don't want to go that far, essentially, we would expect to see zero current flowing. It's a very high quality oxide. The oxide is a very good insulator. We have very few defects that allow that might allow charge trapping or movement of, of electrons through our oxide layer. So this is what we would expect. But what I want to show you is if we engineer that oxide in particular ways, we can do something a lot more interesting and we can get behavior that looks something more like this. So what we have here is um, a current voltage plot. So we're varying the voltage, measuring the current. This is a logarithmic scale here on the, on the y-axis. And we have, in this case, a thin, when I say thin, it's of the order of 20 or 30 nanometers layer of, um, silicon oxide and by varying the voltage we can take our device or our, our oxide from in this case imagine we're going in this direction so we're going first of all into the negative polarity and we start off with um, a current that flows 
but the current is relatively small. So in this case, it's maybe tens of, of microamps. And then at some threshold voltage here, around about uh, minus 0.6 volts, point, minus 0.7 volts, something like that, we suddenly see an abrupt change. And at this abrupt change, suddenly the uh, current will jump by an order of magnitude or more. And in some of our devices, that jump can be five or six orders of magnitude. And now we're in another state where if we reduce the voltage, we stay at a, in a low resistance state. If we increase the voltage again, we would go back up here and back down here, and we would just follow that track. We've changed the resistance state of the oxide. If we now reverse the polarity, we start here. Um, so we're in a lower resistance state. The current that flows is, is relatively high. And then at some point, we start to see a reduction in that current. And if we reduce the voltage, we come back down this curve. So we've now switched the device from a high resistance state to a low resistance state, or low current to high current, and then from high resistance, uh, sorry, sorry, low resistance to high resistance again. And we can do that multiple times. And that's why you can see these, these multiple um, colors here. So we're going through, I think in this case, maybe 20 cycles or, or something like that. So this is very interesting because what this suggests is that we have the possibility here, at least of a memory device. We have two discrete states and we can switch between one state and the other by varying the bias voltage. So the question is, what's happening? I said that we would expect to see very little current, if any current, and here we see quite significant currents at relatively low voltages. So what's happening? Well, as an indication, I just want to show you a little movie here. So what are we looking at? We're looking through a microscope down onto uh, this background is, the, is a sample that has a thin oxide. It's about 30 nanometers thick, silicon oxide. Below that is a, is a metal electrode. On top of it, here we have a gold electrode that's just been very roughly evaporated through um, just a shadow mask, so a hole in a, in a mask. And then this dark thing that's coming in from the left-hand side is a probe, uh, in this case, uh, I think it's a tungsten probe that is just contacting to the, um, the, the electrode here, the gold electrode. And then what we're going to do is we're going to apply a voltage bias between this top electrode and the back electrode, which sits beneath, behind the, uh, the, the plane of the screen, if you like, and we're going to see what happens. So we would expect nothing to happen, wouldn't we? We would expect no current to flow if it's a high quality silicon oxide. And looking at this movie, we wouldn't expect to see anything. So this is what happens. Clearly something dynamic is happening there. Something is bubbling out of the oxide by the look of it. And if you were a, a CMOS engineer, you would look at that and think this is a bit of a horror movie. This is something that really looks very unpleasant indeed. What this is telling us is that this oxide, which is just silicon oxide, is not as stable a material as we thought it should be. We've seen some of the electrical characteristics in the previous slide. There's something very interesting going on that we may be able to use and control. So what is this that is, that is moving? What is this that is bubbling out of the oxide? Well, one thing we can do is we can now um, take a cross-sectional transmission electron microscope image of, excuse me, one of these layers. Um, so here we have the top of a layer, the bottom of a layer, and uh, this is about uh, 20 nanometers or so thick. And what we're doing is we're mapping out in that oxide layer so we've taken a very thin slice through it. So the top electrode would be here, the bottom electrode there, and we're looking through sideways, if you like. And we can look at the density of the material, and you can see there's a bit of a variation in density, so it doesn't look very homogeneous. We can look at the, the um, composition by mapping out where the silicon atoms are. We do this by putting a beam of electrons through the oxide and looking to see how much energy is lost by the electrons as they go through the oxide. And the energy that is lost depends on the chemical nature of the uh, of the atom that the electron beam is interacted with. So we can map out where the silicon is, we can map out where the oxygen is. And the first thing we see is, in, so this is pristine material, this is material oxide that we haven't applied an electrical bias to. And we see that it's a bit lumpy density wise, it's a bit lumpy in terms of the distribution of silicon, and it's a bit lumpy in terms of the oxygen, it's not very homogeneous. But when we bias it, that lumpiness, that inhomogeneity becomes more pronounced. We see more 
um, variation in the concentration of silicon and the concentration of oxygen after we've biased the device. And what we've established is that what's happening here is the oxygen is moving. And if you slightly close your eyes and look particularly at this silicon um, uh, map here on the right hand side, you can maybe persuade yourself there might be some vertical lines in this. It's a little hard to tell in this, but there might be a few vertical lines, particularly, particularly around here. There seems to be more silicon in that region than there is in this region. And correspondingly, less oxygen. The oxygen is moving. And what we find is that if we take some of this material and we put it in a vacuum chamber and we bias it and we have a mass spectrometer in the vacuum chamber, we can actually measure pulses of oxygen, in fact, oxygen molecules, O2 molecules, being released from the oxide when we bias it particularly hard. So that's telling us that, that it's a very dynamic material. We can move oxygen. If we move oxygen, then what we also find is that when we measure those currents, those current voltage curves, remember those currents that I showed you that flow through the, the oxide, if we change the size of the top electrodes, we find that the current doesn't vary significantly. So for a very large electrode, which might be of the order of millimeters in size, compared to one that might be hundreds of nanometers, we see essentially the same current. And that tells us that we have a single conductive channel between the top electrode and the bottom electrode that is forming rather than we're modifying the conductivity of all of the oxide underneath the top electrode there's a single channel that forms and we call this filamentary conduction so we're forming a conductive filament when we bias the device so we wanted to see if we could see those filaments and we tried looking and the technique that we had the most success with was a technique uh, based on atomic force microscopy so in atomic force microscopy you have a very sharp uh, tip which might be um, of the order, this this uh, the tip radius at the end here might be of the order of maybe a few nanometers, maybe eight to ten nanometers or so, and that tip is attached to a long cantilever here, which we move across the surface. And in one mode, if the surface has some roughness, some structure to it, then this tip will move up and down, and we can measure the deflection of the tip by bouncing a laser off the back of the tip, and we can measure the surface features down to well actually less than uh, less than a, a nanometer significantly less than a nanometer in height the other thing we can do is we can apply an electrical bias between the tip if the tip is conductive and in this case um, bottom electrode that, that this oxide is deposited on and we can map out regions where we have high or low conductivity and if we do that on, on one of our samples here we can see that at the top here we see a region that has much higher conductivity than the surrounding region. Okay, so we're measuring a current here about 500 nanoamps and essentially zero all around it. Now, if that tip is very hard and we can make this a conductive diamond, we can push the tip into the surface and we can actually scratch away the surface. And then we take another scan and we scratch away a little bit more of the surface, we take another scan, and eventually we take slices through this material. And by stacking those slices on top of each other, we can reconstruct the region of high conductivity and hopefully if we can look for one of these filaments that's forming and here it looks like we've seen the top of a filament we can then profile it in three dimensions and that's what we did and this is what we see we see in this case a filament here that connects the top of top electrode would be at the top here bottom electrode at the bottom and we can see a filament that's forming but also interestingly there's internal structure to this it's not just a single uh, a single pathway but there's a lot of interesting internal structure. Can you see these sorts of columns that are sort of gr seem to be growing out of the bottom electrode towards the top electrode? So we're seeing evidence of the conductive filament and also some internal structure in the oxide, which I'll come back to in, in, in a second. But you can see here uh, the slices that we've taken and then we've reconstructed those slices to produce this three-dimensional representation of a conductive filament. Okay, so what about that microstructure that I've just shown you? Well, another way of looking at that is to take, again, a transmission electron uh, image of this, uh, TEM, transmission electron microscope image. So here what we've got is a, a thin layer um, of the order of about 30 to 40 nanometers of our silicon oxide. We're looking through it, the side of it. So there's a top electrode here, bottom electrode here. We have a very thin 
lamella, very thin slice, which may be of the order of 50 to 100 nanometers thick, and we're looking through that with an electron beam. And we've turned the contrast way up, so this, the top electrode and the bottom electrode are completely saturated. But what we can see is there's some structure here in the oxide. We can first of all see that there's a rough bottom interface and a rough top interface, which is not typical. We did, we deliberately made these rough. If you were making a CMOS device, you would want that to be very flat. And we can see these vertical lines that seem to come out of regions where we have these valleys in the bottom electrode. These are the edges of columns. So actually, when we grow this oxide, which we do by a technique called sputtering, when we grow the oxide, we create the oxide in columns. And those columns then merge together to form a continuous film. But you still have these column boundaries where there is a relatively high concentration of defects. By defects, I mean strained bonds, uh, dangling bonds, uh, maybe some contamination with, with OH groups, moisture, hydrogen. And these defects span the oxide going from the top to the bottom. So we thought, well, these could be regions where we form these filaments because they're defective. They're regions where maybe oxygen could move easily. And if we have more of these, if we can control these, the density of the, the distribution of these, the density of them, the size of them, maybe we can control the electrical characteristics of the oxide and it turns out that's exactly what we can do so a very simple thing to do is vary this roughness and that roughness templates the formation of these columns so if you're very smooth uh, interface it's more difficult to form the columns a very rough interface the columns form very easily so what we did was we took three different samples where we measured the roughness with this atomic force microscope of this bottom electrode and then we deposited an oxide on top and a top electrode, and we measured the electrical characteristics. And what we found was that for the smoothest sample, so this is an RMS roughness, this is a measure of the mean roughness, if you like, across, uh, in this case, a two micron by two micron area. The smoothest one is an RMS roughness of a bit less than a nanometer. The roughest one, about one and a half nanometers. So here are the AFM images. Here are the corresponding IV characteristics, and we see one really important thing. So what I didn't tell you at the beginning was that we start off with an oxide that is very resistive. And then we apply a relatively high voltage and we form the filament. And then the cycles that I showed you previously are what happens after you form that filament. So we've gone from a pristine state, which is very highly resistive, to a low resistance state. And then when we uh, switch to a high resistance state, we don't go all the way back to the original very high resistance, but we go to an intermediate resistance. So a pristine state, a low resistance, and a high resistance. And that electroforming process is really important because that defines what the filament looks like. And one of the things that's very important about it is what is the voltage that we need to apply in order to electroform. And we want that voltage not to be too high because ideally, if we were to make devices based on this, uh, on this phenomenon, we would want them to integrate with CMOS microelectronics. So we would want voltages um, that were of the order of a volt to maybe three volts, nothing higher than that. Well, for this very smooth surface, that electroforming here, you can see that on the far left of this graph here. So we start off with very high resistance. So we're down in the nanoamp range down here at about a volt. And then suddenly this abrupt electroforming where we create the filament happens at over six volts. Here, where we have the, the smoothest interface, that's reduced to about three volts. So we've halved that electroforming voltage just by changing that roughness. We can also control very nicely by varying that roughness the voltages at which we then switch from the high resistance to that intermediate state. So now we can get that down at about a volt. In fact, we can do it less than a volt. And we can start to access not just two states, but multiple states. And here we have about 30 states, I think it is. Um, so if you took a slice, say, through say one volt here, you can see there are multiple resistance states. So we're going through one cycle and then reducing the voltage here, and then we're gradually increasing the voltage. And we go through that cycle and we increase the voltage a little bit more, and we have that cycle and so on and so on and so on. And just by gradually increasing this voltage that we apply before we reduce it again, we can access many, many different resistance states. So that allows us then to think about these devices, not just as memories that have two states, but
devices that have maybe an analog variation of resistance, then we can cycle between, excuse me, these different states many, many times. And in fact, we've got up to uh, 10 million times. Uh, some, some of our devices have cycled 10 million times and they still function. Uh, so we can go far more than that. So that's all very interesting. That, that tells you a little bit about the materials side of this and uh, what's happening in, in materials and how we can vary these electrical, electrical characteristics. Let's now think about what that means in terms of where we started, thinking about the computation that we could do with these types of devices. What does it allow us to do that, that maybe is um, either equivalent to what CMOS can do or maybe beyond what CMOS can do? And I want to think about taking some of these um, thin films of silicon oxide and now putting those thin films at cross points between uh, an array of conductive lines here which are going left to right and conductive lines here that are going top to bottom so in between those conductive lines we have a thin film of this silicon oxide so we've created a device a metal insulator metal device and these devices go by many names um, you may have heard them called memristors uh, resistive RAM devices, resistive switches. Uh, I'll call them memristors uh, because these are devices whose resistance depends on their past history, what voltages have been applied, what currents have flowed. So if we imagine that each of these cross points here, we have one of these memristors and we're able to, in an analog way, vary the resistance of each of those memristors, then what we can do is we can actually program into this array a series of numbers analog numbers so each of these cross points has a different resistance and then if we apply in this case a series of voltages to all of these horizontal lines let's call them word lines and then we measure the current coming out of each of these vertical lines let's call them bit lines then what we get is each of the currents here is the sum of all of the voltages multiplied by the conductances of each of the uh, the cross points here. So what does that give us? That gives us a mathematical operation. It gives us actually the sum of, um, it's a matrix multiplication operation, which is actually one of the main operations that's going on inside a GPU when the GPU is running a machine learning algorithm. Most of what it's doing is this type of operation. And in one of those GPUs, what you have to do is, because it's a digital system, you have an array of values, which is a matrix in memory, and you have to read each of those array elements in one by one, and then you read another element in, which is what you want to multiply that by. You then go through a number of clock cycles to multiply the two together, and then you write that back to another array. So point by point, you have to do each all of those processes. So as your array gets bigger, as the size of this matrix scales, then the cost, the energy cost, the time cost, the complexity of that, of that operation scales roughly as the square of the size of the matrix. In this case, however, if we just simply apply voltages and read currents, Ohm's law here, just you know, conductance times voltage gives you a current, does everything for you in a single shot. So in fact, the scaling, well, there isn't any scaling. So once you've written your, um, uh, your, uh, matrix values into this uh, matrix it doesn't matter how big the matrix is you get your answer in one shot so this saves you a huge amount of, of, of uh, time energy power uh, here's just an example of a crossbar array that we've made in in our in our um, labs so we have you know, horizontal lines going along here vertical lines going along here and where they cross we have a thin oxide layer okay so that that's potentially very appealing because that allows us to do the sorts of things in digital electronics that we already do, but do them more efficiently. But actually now when we think about this, maybe there are other ways that we can use these devices, not just accelerating existing approaches, but thinking about whole new ways of doing computation. And one of the inspirations here is to think about how biology does this. And here's um, a very complex image of a number of neurons um, showing you how complex biology is. So this is a snapshot, if you like, of a segment of a neural system. We have neurons, we have dendrites, axons, we have uh, synapses, all sorts of <coughs> biological structures here that perform computation. And the unit of this, if you like, is, is 
um, the neuron, which is a particular type of cell that has um, an axon, which is essentially a little bit like an electronic transmission line, signals propagate along this axon, um, which connects to other neurons or other structures in biology, maybe to muscles or glands or whatever. And this neuron receives inputs into these dendrites, which are many different electrical connections, if you like, then performs some processing on them and then sends out a signal that goes to some other structures further on down the line. And it does that via these structures called synapses, synaptic gaps. There's a gap at the end of each of these um, dendrites and axons across which uh, an electrical signal propagates. It actually propagates often through chemical means, but it's an electrical signal. And the strength of that connection so the likelihood that a signal will propagate depends on the past history of that connection. Now that sounds very familiar because that sounds similar to the way that our devices work. The resistance of our devices depends on their past history. Okay, so let's look into this a little bit further. So in biology, what happens is the, the signal that propagates is something called an action potential. It's a spike, it's a voltage spike. It's quite a complex spike. It's not just a delta function, but um, we have an, a rise, then a decay, and then there's a reverse in polarity, and then a recovery to zero. And the reason that this is complex is because there are a number of processes that, that contribute to this. We have potassium and calcium channels within a neuron, in fact, in the membrane of the neuron, that can open and close. And as they open and close, ions move backwards and forwards across that, um, that membrane through the channel. And because the ions, ions, they carry charge, what that does is that that creates a, 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 a potential pulse, a variation of potential that looks like a pulse as those channels open and close. Now, one way of looking at that, if we don't want to deal too much with the, the chemistry, is to think of the equivalent electrical circuit. And on the left hand here, we have the equivalent electrical circuit of the neural membrane. So here we have a calcium channel, uh, sorry, calcium sorry, uh, potassium channel, uh, sodium channel, but there are also these, these systems called pumps which try to maintain uh, a given potential difference across the, the membrane. So as ions diffuse in or out, this might push them back the other way to try and maintain uh, a, a, a constant potential. But if we just look at the equivalent electrical circuit of this, what do we have? We have something that's like an insulator. So this membrane, which is a lipid membrane, and so there's fatty molecules. Um, which looks like an insulator. So you know, we have some conductive medium outside, conductive medium inside, that looks like a capacitor. Then we have these channels whose resistance is variable. They look like variable resistors. And actually there may be an inbuilt potential because of the, the separation in charge there. If we look at our devices and re-RAM or memristor devices, what do we have? We have an insulating layer, the oxide, which looks like a capacitor. And then we have these filaments which allow current to flow. And the filament resistance, which is actually related to the width of the filament, can be varied. So we have these varying resistances. And there may be an in inbuilt potential again due to separation of charge. So actually, the biological and the semiconductor model look very similar. So you might think in that case, well, maybe our devices can perform some of the functions of neurons. So the functions of neurons that interest us are the generation of spikes, the generation of those voltage spikes, the capability to take multiple inputs and integrate multiple inputs to give a single output, and this phenomenon known as thresholding, which is that you take a number of inputs and only when the sum of those inputs goes above a certain threshold does the neuron do something, and in this case, maybe produce a spike or a train of spikes. So it'd be nice if our devices did something similar. And it turns out they do. So this graph here shows uh, the voltage across one of our devices, across a memristor, as a function of time. If we bias that memristor with a constant current, so it's a slightly different experiment to what I showed previously, where we're varying the voltage and measuring the current. Here we're just keeping a constant current and measuring the voltage as it varies with time. And what we find is that as we increase that bias from about one microamp to 13 microamps, then we go from a situation here, this curve at the bottom, where essentially very little is happening, there's the odd very small voltage spike, 
as we increase that current, gradually we start to see more spikes. Spiking becomes more, uh, more frequent, the spikes become larger. And interestingly, the spikes have grouped themselves into these little pulses. And that's very similar to the way that, that biology, some neurons work, there are different types of neurons that work in different ways, but some of them produce these tightly uh, bunched voltage spikes. So this is very appealing. So now we have a single device that can behave like a neuron, and we've shown that it also can perform integration, taking multiple inputs and then integrating them, and it can perform thresholding. This is an example of that. Once we go above a certain threshold, we go from essentially zero spikes to uh, regular spikes here. Okay, we can take that a little bit further and think about the, the synapse, the connection between the neurons. And I said that the uh, the behavior of the synapse depends on its past history. So there are various ways that, that biology um, exploits that. And one of those is using um, this, what we call a local learning rule called spike timing dependent plasticity. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that if you imagine this synaptic gap between two uh, two neurons and one neuron produces a voltage spike, that voltage spike meets that synaptic gap and then propagates across the gap. But maybe at the same time, the second neuron also produces a spike, which is propagating in the opposite direction. Then depending on the relative timing of those two spikes, when they arrive at the synaptic gap, the resistance or the conductance of the synaptic gap can change. So it can either increase or decrease depending on whether those two spikes overlap. And that is this spike timing dependent plasticity. Plasticity just means it's changing its conductance. And it, depend, it does that depending on the relative timing of these voltage spikes. So on the left here, we have a plot from biology that shows um, as we vary that relative timing, what happens? And we can say that uh, in this case, a measure which is a bit like a measure of, of conductance, um, we can either go up if one pulse arrives before the other, or if we swap the order of them, then it can go down as we vary the timing. So we get this reinforcement or this inhibition of that synaptic strength. Here on the right is a similar plot for one of our memristic devices. So this is, unfortunately, we seem to have lost the, um, the labels here, but this is in uh, microseconds. Okay, so here um, we're looking at the relative timing of two voltage spikes that arrive at one memristor and we can see if spike A arrives first, we get an increase in, in this case in conductance. And if spike B arrives first, we get a decrease in conductance and there's a crossover point here. So we've implemented what looks like a biological learning rule. That could be very useful. We can do other things as well. So when we bias our devices, we don't actually have to think about making those abrupt changes in resistance going you know, maybe an order of magnitude or, or more from a high resistance or a low resistance state and back again. But actually we can slowly modify the resistance by biasing them in, in just the right way. And we can get this, this sort of behavior here. This is a plot of current flowing through our devices as a function of time. What we've done here is we've initially um, stressed the device, in this case with a constant current, then removed that current, applied a voltage, and we see this, we see an increase initially of the current, and then a decrease. And the shape of this transient behavior depends on the voltage that we apply. So we go from one volt here, minus one volt in fact, where we just see a, an increase in the saturation to above maybe minus 1.5 volts, certainly evident at minus two volts, we see an increase and then a decrease. So depending on where we are, either side of this peak, we can either increase or decrease the conductance of our device by applying a bias. So we can exploit that by, instead of applying a constant bias, applying a series of pulses. And as those pulses, as the frequency of those pulses varies, we can either increase or decrease the conductance. And we can start to do computation with that. So in a very simple um, example of that, what we've done is we've taken one of our devices where we've biased it in this way, and we've, we've uh, positioned ourselves so that um, depending on the, the width or the frequency of our voltage pulses that we apply, we can either increase or decrease the conductance. And we've used that in an example where we have taken an image, an image on, there's a series of images here on the, on the left, 
And then we've encoded the pixels of those images as a frequency, each pixel, the intensity of each pixel is frequency. And then we can compare two neighboring um, pixels, compare the frequency of the two, apply those two frequencies to our device, and we either get an increase or a decrease in the conductance, and that allows us to detect the edges in these images very efficiently. So no digital manipulation here. This is just purely done with one of our analog devices. We can go a bit further and we can see that if we now take one of our devices and we apply a voltage which is too small for there to be that sudden jump, that formation of the filament. So the, the voltage that we've applied isn't enough to start separating, moving the oxygen and separating it from, from the silicon. But we apply at the same time a stream of photons, we shine light on the system, and that light is absorbed here in the semiconductor at the bottom. Well, when the semiconductor absorbs light, what happens is you generate carrier pairs if that light is sufficient, has sufficient energy, if it's above band gap to, to produce those carrier pairs. You produce carrier pairs, so you produce electrons. And if there's a small bias applied across this oxide, those electrons will be pulled. If you put the positive bias on the top here, negative bias here on the bottom, those electrons will be pulled into the oxide. And when they're pulled into the oxide, actually injection of electrons, I haven't talked about the model of why we form um, uh, mobile oxygen, but essentially trapping electrons in the oxide is the first step in that. So by injecting electrons, that creates more mobile oxygen, it creates the filament. So suddenly by switching this light on, we suddenly see the device switch on from being highly resistive to being uh, conductive. So now we've got the possibility of doing some really interesting things with this, what we thought was a very stable oxide to start with. We can change its resistance by very large amounts in a digital way. We can change it in analog ways, so we get almost a continuous variation that allows us to do some interesting, you know, maybe multi-level storage or some processing. We can create devices that behave like neurons and synapses. We can start to do interesting things um, by looking at this, this sort of transients that I showed you in the previous slide and the devices are sensitive to light. So now we can think about something that maybe is a smart sensor that is able to sense light, do some processing on it and store some information. So that capability to do things in the way that the biological neural system, the brain does it, is known as neuromorphic. So neuromorphic engineering or neuromorphic computing or neuromorphic devices, devices that behave in ways that are similar to the brain. Now, there are various different definitions of what that means. So you can, for example, think of a digital system that simulates the way that the brain works. And in a sense, that's kind of neuromorphic. But really what I'm talking about here is devices that have inherent electrical properties or optical properties that allow you to do things fundamentally in the way the brain operates rather than simulating it. And that allows us to think about a sort of hierarchy of, of what we might want to achieve here. So we might want to do computing in the way the brain does it. The reasons for that, if we go back early on in, in this presentation, we looked at that huge difference in power consumption between the brain at about 20 watts and nearly eight megawatts for a digital computer. So if we can take a lesson from biology, we're not building an artificial brain, we're just taking lessons from biology. Maybe we can make our neuromorphic computing systems much more energy efficient than digital systems. To do that, we need to think about neuromorphic engineering, which means, well, um, what do the systems look like that go into neuromorphic computing? Neuromorphic computing will be concerned with algorithms as well as, you know, what, what do computer programs look like on these systems? Neuromorphic engineering is more about what do those electronic systems look like? And into neuromorphic engineering, we need to think about neuromorphic devices, devices that behave in ways that allow us to do things the way the brain does things. And that's where we come in with our silicon oxide. I call it SiOx because it's not SiO2, which would be what we would normally think of as silicon oxide, silicon dioxide. But maybe there's a little bit less oxygen in there. Maybe that's that's how we create these defects that, that create the filaments that give us the, the interesting behavior that we want. So there's a sort of hierarchy there that we're interested in. And just to finish off, what I really want to say is if we think about this neuromorphic computing, and I've just shown a very small snapshot of of maybe how the devices that we uh, we create and we study maybe feed into neuromorphic computing. But maybe 
on a broader scale, what could neuromorphic computing do for us? Well, it could increase the processing power that we have on devices because we don't any longer have to worry so much about moving data backwards and forwards, but the data are processed in the place where the data is stored. We can integrate sensors directly perhaps into this as well, but I showed you the, the, the possibility of, of uh, light affecting the resistance states of our devices. And hopefully it would greatly reduce the energy requirements for our computing systems. And really we need to do that because in, in current, current estimates say that just data centers alone in three years time may be consuming up to 20% of the global electricity output because we have this von Neumann bottleneck, which means we're moving data around, which costs a lot of energy. And we're doing that a lot because we have thousands of, of, of GPUs in these huge server farms that are chewing up massive amounts of electricity. But if we were to do things differently and not have to move that data around so much and have inherently more efficient systems, maybe, just maybe we can bring that power consumption way, way down. And I think that's something we all ought to be looking towards doing if we can. So I'll, I'll finish there. Very happy to, to discuss this, take questions. Um, a few acknowledgements here. So various members of my team. So I'm very privileged to talk about this work, um, but it's actually these guys who do the work. So these are the PhD students and postdocs and collaborators who uh, we've worked with. There are many other names that I, that I uh, haven't put up here as well. They've worked on other aspects of, of what we do, but um, these are the people who actually did the work. And I would just like to, at this point, stop and thank you very much for your attention and invite any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tony. Thank you for this uh, level talk. So now floor is open for the audience. If you'd like to ask any questions from our uh, speaker, then please go ahead and mute yourself and then please go ahead. Hello, Professor. This is uh, Mohit. And thank yes. you for this pleasant talk. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, my first question is uh, how the switching behavior uh, changes with different material combinations in switching material. What materials uh, we should really integrate as switching materials for different applications like digital logic design, memory, and neuromorphic computing? Great. Okay, really good question. Yeah. Um, let me, in that case, first of all, just go back to this slide uh, here, perhaps. So that's that's a typical switching curve. So that's the sort of thing that you're talking about. I missed out the electroforming, but this is a typical switching curve. Um, right. There are a number of things that you need to think about in. Uh, in sir, sorry to disturb you, uh, sir. I can't see anything. Uh, whatever. Ah, that's probably because I'm not sharing, am I? Um, am I still sharing? Let me put this up. Can you see that? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is a sort of curve that that that, um, that is at the heart of switching. So there's a number of things that you need to consider when you're answering answering your question. So, first of all, if we want to integrate with CMOS microelectronics, which we almost certainly do, because um, silicon microelectronics is the basis of virtually all of our microelectronic systems, and I don't see that changing anytime soon then we need to be very careful about what materials we choose because we want to make sure that they are uh, so-called fab friendly. So they go into the foundries, the fabs, and don't pose problems with contamination or diffusion during processing and so on. So there's actually quite a limited number of materials that we can consider. In terms of oxides, silicon oxide is the most fab friendly that you can think of because it is the native oxide of, of silicon microelectronics. There are other oxides such as hafnium oxide, um, which is now widely used as that gate oxide for various reasons, rather than silicon oxide. Um, and there are maybe a handful of others that, that, that might be uh, useful uh, or certainly fab friendly. Um, now, there are more exotic materials. In fact, almost any oxide, in fact, I would guess if I was to say any oxide, um, if it's solid, will show this resistive switching behavior. Um, and many polymers as well. And there are various other ways that we can get resistance switching. So I've talked about the movement of oxygen, but we can, for example, take a, a very high quality oxide, not put loads of defects in it like we do, and diffuse metals in instead, and you produce a metallic filament. And you do that very easily with metals like silver and copper. The problem is, although you get very nice switching behavior, there are some issues with stability. Um, you really don't want to have metals 
that are diffusing in CMOS electronics. So a fab really doesn't like that. So although the, the switching characteristics might be quite nice, a fab won't want to work with those materials. Similarly, uh, with polymer materials, they could be useful for plastic electronics, but in mainstream CMOS, they won't be integrated because the um, uh, temperature stability is, is, is too poor. So really you, you're limited to a relatively small number of oxides. So essentially silicon, hafnium, maybe tantalum uh, oxide, maybe titanium oxide. All of those show resistance switching. All of those show very nice behavior. One of the advantages of silicon oxide, not only is it the most easy to integrate, but also because the band gap of silicon oxide is very wide, it's about eight or nine electron volts. It means that the resistance states are very stable. There are one or two other advantages as well, but it, it's, it's a nice material to choose. But people have looked quite um, extensively at hafnium and, and tantalum oxide, and there are technologies based on, on some of those out there. I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir, that... yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, my next question is, uh, what should be the properties of oxygen reservoir layer over the uh, switching yeah. material for the yeah. efficient quality of filament formation? Also a very good question. You obviously know something about reram. Yes. So um, when we move oxygen, so the results that I showed where we're releasing oxygen, you really don't want to be doing that in, in a working device. That's just to show that oxygen movement is at the heart of, of the changes that we see. What you really want yes. to be doing is, is moving oxygen a very small amount so that you um, oxidize and reduce only a portion of the filament. So you need to have an oxygen reservoir somewhere in the system. Yes, sir. So what properties would you like with the oxygen reservoir? Well, first of all, it needs to be a stable reservoir, so it, it shouldn't be losing oxygen to the environment. Um, then, hang on just a second. Somebody, I just, somebody is trying to call me and I just need to make sure that I switch that off. Yes, sir. Right. Okay. Um, so, sorry about that distraction. Um, it needs to be a stable oxygen reservoir so the oxygen isn't released to the environment. It also needs to be something that can release oxygen back into the the reram uh, cell, into the yes, filament. Sir. Yes, sir. So, it turns out that one of the ways that we think we can do that quite effectively in our devices is by using titanium. So, if yes, we sir. have a silicon oxide layer and then we put a thin layer of titanium metal, and by thin, a couple of nanometers of titanium metal on top of that. What titanium then does is it's very good at scavenging, taking oxygen out of the, 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 the silicon oxide. But if we apply a bias to it, it's also quite good at then putting the oxygen back into the silicon. And the reason for that is if you look at the, the thermodynamics of the oxidation of silicon and the oxidation of, um, of titanium, then one of the quantities that governs whether something will oxidize is Gibbs free energy. And the yes. lower the Gibbs free energy, the, the more likely you, you will see uh, a particular reaction, in this case, oxidation. Well, it turns out the Gibbs free energy of oxidation of titanium and of silicon is very similar. So that means it's relatively easy to move oxygen backwards and forwards between the two elements. If it was very different, then you'd have a big yes. asymmetry where the, the oxygen would tend to go in one direction and be very difficult to pull it back the other way. So you would want a system a little bit like that. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, my last question is about like uh, how usage of different electrode materials affect the performance of memristive devices and which type of contact, like uh, nature of contact, is suitable for neuromorphic computation, uh, that is for synapses. Yep, okay. Um, the choice of electrodes is critical uh, for a yes, number sir. of reasons. There's, there's the practical reasons that, you know, some materials are fab friendly and others aren't. But beyond yes, that, you could, for example, take a very simple system, <coughs> excuse me, where you had um, an oxide, let's say silicon oxide or hafnium oxide, and you just put the same metal top and bottom, and a common metal that's used is titanium nitride. So you might have titanium nitride oxide, titanium nitride. Well, in that case, the system is symmetrical, whether you look at it top down or bottom up. And that means when you electrically bias your, your device, there's no preference for the device to electroform in, in one polarity or the other, and it's purely symmetrical. And that isn't necessarily where you want to be. You probably want some asymmetry in the system so that you get a nice um, differentiation between going from high resistance to low resistance and low to high, and you don't get these competing um, electroforming at both voltage 
both polarities. So you need to build ideally some degree of asymmetry in. So that means you probably want a different metal top and bottom. Um, now, you do have to worry a little bit about um, diffusion of metals. So if you use copper or silver, they diffuse very readily into oxide. So you probably want to avoid those. Yes. You then want to think about the um, electrochemistry of that oxidation process. And you might want to think about the um, oxygen affinity, the ease with which you can oxidize the top and, and bottom electrodes. Um, and you want to have dif different oxygen affinities. Ideally, you'd want it to be very different. But unfortunately, what happens is um, if you have very, very um, low oxygen affinities, those metals tend to be the noble metals like gold and platinum and palladium and so on and they're they're very expensive and gold certainly you wouldn't want to have in CMOS. So there are often compromises to be made there. So you're probably looking at selecting metals from a again a relatively small uh group. So it may be um you know metallic compounds like titanium nitride. Um you may be looking at uh, tungsten, titanium um ruthenium and a handful of others um and avoiding copper and and silver and uh, others that may diffuse but it yes, is sorry. really really critical to think about what what that electrode material is it's also critical to think about what the nature of the interface looks like between the electrode and the oxide so whether there are a lot of defects there whether it's smooth or rough yes sir. thank you sir uh for this answer thank you you're welcome uh, thank you, Professor Tony. Is there any from the audience who would like to ask uh, any uh, query to Professor Tony? And you into silence. Yeah, I think they're long. Okay, yeah, thank you, Professor Tony. I have one question for you actually. Mm. So, uh, for the uh, basically in the crossbar array, basically mm. we have uh, multiple devices. So, we uh, stack the device to device or cycle to cycle variability. Mm -hmm. So, the, how does impact on these cycle to cycle uh, device to device variability on the neuromorphic characteristics? Because in the in the neuron system, we have the millions or billions of the uh, neurons actually, yeah. and then the, every memory to devices represents a single unit of the synapse like that. So, the variation in the D two D and C two C, how the impact on the uh, neuromorphic characteristics actually? Yeah. So that's an interesting question, and uh, I can give a very, very long answer or a more condensed answer. So the, I'll give you the more condensed answer. So um, not as much as you would expect. So there's there's often received wisdom in CMOS microelectronics. Every device needs to be absolutely identical, and every cycle of every device needs to be absolutely identical. And with these memristors, that's not the case. There is device to device and cycle to cycle variability. Well, we've done some studies that have taken into account these non-idealities as we call them. So variability between devices, variability between cycles, devices that, that are stuck on or stuck off and, and so on. And what we find is that um, actually there there is there is an advantage in some cases to having a bit of variability. And the reason that it sounds counterintuitive, but the reason that, that there is potentially an advantage is this when when you think about what you're doing in some of these these um, algorithms when you're trying to um, essentially they're all decision making algorithms they're sort of pattern matching and decision making what you're doing is you're taking a mathematical function you're finding the minimum of it and you might have a local minimum and a global minimum and what you want to do is you want to find the global minimum and not a local minimum. So imagine some complex function that does something like this, and you want to find that global minimum, not get stuck in a local minimum over here. The conventional way you would do that in a digital system is that you would have some sort of gradient descent method, which would you know look to see what the differential was of your function, and gradually keep going until you know the differential becomes zero, go down down some gradient. How do you know that's not a local minimum? Well, then you put a little bit of noise into the system. So you deliberately kick your system out to another point in parameter space and you then do another minimization. So you need a little bit of noise. Um, and there's an optimum, you might need 10 or 15% of noise in the system, but that's injected in the digital system. In an analog system like ours, that noise is there anyway. So you don't need that extra step. And in fact, you can converge on the solution potentially more efficiently. So that's. Um, that's 
one way of looking at things. The other way is we've looked at various ways to mitigate some of these, so overcome some of these um, variability issues. And there are various ways you can do this by engineering the devices so they're less variable. But there are other ways that are equally powerful where you think about the algorithm that you are using. And one simple way of doing this, we call it committee machines, is that you don't have a single crossbar array. You maybe have three or five crossbar arrays and you take the average of the output. So you might look at that and think, well, that's very complex because now you've gone from one crossbar array to three or five crossbar arrays. So you've got a bigger footprint, more devices. Well, no, actually, if you take a given number of devices and instead of putting them all in one crossbar, put them in three crossbars, you can get a much higher degree of accuracy. So you can go from something like, um, let's say you had a lot of devices that were very variable and a lot of devices that were stuck on or off and you had a terrible accuracy for handwriting recognition of maybe 60% or 70%. Put that into three or five crossbar arrays, you can get that up to 95%. Same number of devices in the same states, so the same variability and so on. But now by having multiple crossbar arrays without having to create any more devices, but taking an average of the output, can get very, very high accuracy. And the other thing I'd say, which is more a conceptual thing, which is going back to that point of all devices have to be identical and they all have to be identical cycle to cycle. I just point to the fact that the brain is extremely noisy, extremely imprecise, deals with very, very imprecise data. And in fact, when you talk to neurologists, neuroscientists, um, and you talk about, well, okay, so a, a neuron responds to a particular input and produces an output, yes? Well, the neurologists say, well, yeah, maybe 50% of the time it does. The rest of the time, it doesn't really work. So we've got something that is really very messy. And you saw the picture of physically how messy it is. And it performs all these amazing feats of, uh, I say calculation, but, you know, decision-making, if you like, at a fraction of the power of our digital systems that are all identical. There's got to be something in there that tells you that you don't have to have everything uniform. And actually this variability might be something that you can use. And people are starting to look more and more at that using variability. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Professor Tony, for your uh, detailed response as well on this. Uh, okay. Uh, this. And okay, so now is the time to what of thanks for today's uh, speaker, Professor Tony Kinoy. Thank you, thank you, Professor Tony. For an, uh, such a uh, wonderful talk and session on the making glass things, and we are really grateful for the time and effort which you took. Share our uh, share your thoughts and research experiences with our IEEE NTC community, and we hope that we will meet in, in person in future as well to say uh, to uh, this, uh, to take uh, knowledge on that uh, uh, recent demanding uh, technology on the especially for the memory store RM for the neuromorphic and uh, other things. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Tony, for joining us today. And then thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Goodbye all. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.